welcome to a special episode of 5-Minute Family Law. This episode is all about the important changes to the Divorce Act that are coming into force on the 1st of March 2021. I've just finished recording a version of this presentation aimed at legal professionals like lawyers and paralegals. That version of this presentation is a little bit more complicated because it uses a lot of legal language and legal terminology and because it assumes that the people who are watching it have some familiarity with the court system and with the current Divorce Act. You can watch that video if you want, of course, but this video I'm going to be using a lot more plain language to explain the sometimes complicated concepts that the amendments to the Divorce Act present. So, without further ado, here is my presentation on the amendments to the Divorce Act. An overview of the coming changes to the Divorce Act. So, what are we talking about? Well, the Divorce Act is a law of the federal government. Because it's a Canadian law, it applies in every province and territory, but it only applies to people who are or used to be married to each other. And that means that if you were never married to your ex or to the other person who is the parent of your child, you need to be looking at the family law legislation of the province or territory in which you live. The Divorce Act just doesn't apply to you. The Divorce Act talks about getting divorced. It talks about parenting after separation using words like custody and access. It also talks about child support and about spousal support. A few years ago, the federal government decided that it was time to update the Divorce Act to talk about parenting after separation using different, more child-centered language, to introduce a new test to help us figure out the course of action that's in the best interests of a child, and another test to help us figure out what should happen when a parent wants to move away from the other parent after separation. All these changes are in Bill C-78, which you can still find on the website of the Parliament of Canada. Bill C-78 cleared the House of Commons and the Senate on the 18th of June, 2019, and received royal assent a day later. But even though the bill is several months old and it's law, the changes that it makes are not yet in effect. That will change on March the 1st, 2021. This is what the bill looks like on the website of the Parliament of Canada. And here you can find all sorts of information, including what the bill looked like when it was first introduced in the House of Commons and what date and what it looked like when it cleared to the Senate. The Bill C-78 is also known as an Act to Amend the Divorce Act. And you can find a version of that available online at the address I've shown on your screen at the website of the Canadian Legal Information Institute. However, we don't yet have a version of the Divorce Act with all the changes being made to it. If you want to see what the, divorce look, what the Divorce Act will look like after the changes come into force, you can get one from my website at www.boydarbitration.ca slash library. All of these changes were supposed to have come into effect on Canada Day last year. However, as a result of problems involving the COVID-19 virus and all the updates to forms and regulations, the coming into force date was pushed back until March the 1st, 2021. The Federal Department of Justice has done a really good job of providing a lot of information about what these changes to the Divorce Act are all about. If you click on the button labeled Information for Professionals, you get this kind of thing. And, it, you get, and if you click on each of the links, you get a fairly technical breakdown of what the changes are and, more, most importantly, you get a comparison of the current act to the changes. And that is sometimes really useful. But for an easier, more plain language explanation, you click on the other button called Information for Families. And here, you can get a really good overview of the changes that are being made. You can learn about how the changes deal with family violence, the different language that we're using to talk about separation and, and parenting after separation, and all sorts of other things. Here, by the way, is what my consolidation of the Divorce Act looks like. Now, the really important changes that we see in Bill C-78 are new language for talking about parenting after separation. We have new duties for people that are getting divorced, and we have a new legal test to help us figure out what's in the best interests of children. And we have another new legal test to help us decide what should happen when a parent wants to move away from the other parent after separation, whether they want to move with the children or without them. But a lot of things aren't changing. What isn't changing is how you go about getting divorced, how we deal with foreign divorce orders, 
and how we deal with issues when there's a religious barrier to getting divorced. The whole thing about child support hasn't changed at all, and neither has the bit about spousal support. Now, let's take a deep dive into Bill C-78, and we're going to start with that new language about parenting after separation. First, we are getting rid of language about custody and access. And in place of that kind of language, we're going to be talking about contact orders, which is contact between a child and somebody who isn't a spouse. People who are spouses will have something called decision-making responsibility, which is all about how parents make important decisions on behalf of their child, such as where do they go to school, and if they get sick, how are they cared for. People who are spouses will also have something called parenting time, which is the time when the child is with them. Together, orders about decision-making responsibility and about parenting time are called parenting orders. There are more new terms. First, we have this really big term called family dispute resolution process, which is a shorthand way of referring to all the different ways that are available to resolve family law problems outside of court, namely negotiation, mediation, collaborative negotiation, and arbitration. We also have a new definition of family member. Now, family member is an important new term because it relates to how the law talks about family violence. And the definition of family violence is a very broad definition. It's actually a lot like the definition of family violence that you see in British Columbia's Family Law Act. Under the Divorce Act, family violence includes conduct that is violent or threatening or constitutes a pattern of coercive controlling behavior that causes a family member, there's that term again, to fear for their own safety or that of another person. But family violence is a really broad term, and it's not just about violence. It includes sexual abuse, harassment, financial abuse, psychological abuse, and failing to provide the necessities of life. Another really important new term is relocation, and that's going to come up when we talk about parents who want to move away after separation. Under the new Divorce Act, relocation is defined as a change in in the home of a child or of a person with parenting time or decision-making responsibility that is likely to have a significant impact on the child's relationship with a spouse, with other important people in the child's life, and on people who have contact. Something else that's new is some new duties. Lawyers in the court have always had certain duties under the, under the Divorce Act, but now People who are spouses and getting divorced also have duties of their own. If you are getting divorced, your duties include the obligation to exercise parenting time and decision-making responsibility in a way that is consistent with the child's best interests. You also have a new duty to protect your child from conflict arising from the divorce proceeding. You also have a duty to try to resolve your dispute through family, law, through family dispute resolution processes, unless there's family violence. And, perhaps most importantly of all, you also have a continuing obligation to provide, quote, complete, accurate, and up-to-date information. What that's all about is making sure that each person is providing the other person with information about their kids, like report cards and medical reports and things like that, but more importantly, information about their finances, their income, income tax returns, notices of assessment, and things like that. And when you're starting or defending a divorce case, you have to write on the form that you understand that you are aware of these duties. Lawyers still have the duties that they've always have, which includes the duty to talk to their clients about the possibility of reconciliation and letting them know about the services that are available to promote reconciliation, like counseling, that are known to them. We're also required to tell our clients that it's important to think about trying to resolve disputes about kids other than through court. We also have a brand new duty to encourage our clients to attempt to resolve their family law disputes using a family dispute resolution process. The new duties of the court include the court being required to consider whether there are any civil protection orders, child protection orders, or criminal orders outstanding or in effect or in process that might affect the best interests of the child. 
This is really interesting because the only other jurisdiction that I know of that has this requirement is British Columbia. And that requirement in British Columbia comes up in the context of people who want to become guardians. And the point is to make sure that the court has all of the relevant information available to it about anything that might have an impact on the safety, security, and well-being of a child when it's making important decisions about guardianship or, under the Divorce Act, parental responsibilities and parenting time. But the court's old duties are still there. They haven't changed. And that includes an obligation on the court not to agree to give you a divorce unless it is satisfied that enough child support is being paid. Also, the court can't grant a divorce if it thinks that you and your spouse might possibly reconcile. So, let's talk about the new test for the best interests of the child. Under the current Divorce Act, it says almost nothing about the best interests of a child. It says that the court has to make decisions considering only the best interests of the child, but the only elaboration on what best interests means is something that appears at the existing section 16 sub 10 that says that the court has to give as much time with each parent as is in the best interests of a child. But all of that is changing. And instead, what we're going to get is a best interest tests that looks a, more, a whole lot more like the kind of test that we see under the provincial legislation. The provincial legislation on family law typically goes into a lot more detail about the factors that you're supposed to think about when you make decisions about what is or is not in the best interests of a child. And in fact, if you want to look at the closest provincial analogy, again, we're talking about British Columbia's Family Law Act. British Columbia's Family Law Act has a lengthy list of factors, including factors relating to family violence that look almost exactly like what we see from the federal government. So, under Section 16 of the new legislation, the court is going to be obliged to give primary consideration to three dominant factors. The child's physical, emotional, and psychological safety, security, and well-being. Now, these primary considerations are to be decided taking into account a long list of factors that you see in section 16 sub 3 of the amended legislation. Those factors include the child's needs in light of the child's age and stage of development, the nature of the child's relationship with the spouses and with other people who have important roles in the child's life, each spouse's willingness to support the child's relationship with the other spouse, the history of the child's care, the child's cultural heritage, including linguistic heritage. And what's really interesting is that there's also an obligation to consider what the child's views and preferences are. And this is very much in line with Canada's obligations under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And what's even more interesting is that section 16 sub 3 creates a presumption that child children's views will be heard, and the only way you can escape having a child's views heard is if they cannot be ascertained, giving weight to the child's age and maturity. And so what that means is that in almost every divorce case involving kids, you're going to have to try to present some evidence relating to the child's views and preferences, because the only way they couldn't be ascertained is if the child is too young to talk to and express a considered opinion about what the child might want to do, or if the child is suffering from an illness or disability that prevents them from expressing their views and preferences. But absent something like that, there's a positive obligation to hear from kids and find out what they want. Other factors include each spouse's plans for the child's care, the ability of each spouse to care for and meet the needs of a child, the ability of each spouse to communicate and cooperate with each other, and like we saw before, any other civil or criminal or child protection proceedings that are relevant to the safety, security, and well-being of the child. But the most important factor on this list is probably whether family violence is present in the home. And under section 16 sub 3, the court is supposed to consider the presence of family violence and how it affects a spouse's ability to care for the child and how it affects the appropriateness of an order that requires spouses to cooperate with each other. 
Now, when family violence is a factor, just like in British Columbia, there are a whole bunch of brand new factors that the court has to consider to help it understand the impact of family violence. These appear in section 16, sub 4 of the new legislation. And those factors include the nature, seriousness, and frequency of the family violence, whether the family violence demonstrates a pattern of coercive and controlling behavior, whether the family violence is directed to the child or whether the child is directly or indirectly exposed to the violence, and a few other factors, including any steps that may have been taken by the, by the abuser to prevent further family violence and to improve their ability to care for the child. Now, let's get into the whole bit about parenting orders and contact orders. Now, the court can make something called parenting orders, which are orders about parenting time or for decision-making responsibility. And the people who can ask for parenting orders are spouses, and people who aren't spouses but are a parent of the child, stand in the place of a parent for the child, or intend to stand in the place of a parent for a child. And the new legislation allows the court to divide parenting time between parents, and I should mention that there's no presumption that any particular distribution of parenting time is the right distribution, including an equal distribution of parenting time between the, the child's parents' homes. The court can also allocate decision-making responsibility. And as I said before, decision-making responsibility includes making important decisions for children, such as giving or withholding consent for school trips or medical treatments, making decisions about where does the child go to school or how does the child get cared for if the child gets sick, all sorts of things. And when the court can allocate decision-making responsibility, it can require that those responsibilities are shared between spouses, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, or it can say that just one spouse will have a particular responsibility. When the court is making parenting orders, it can, it can also impose terms and conditions on those orders, including limitations on how spouses communicate with each other. Right? Or perhaps the court can order that uh, somebody's parenting time will be supervised or conditional upon the parent doing something or not doing something. The court can also send spouses to participate in a family dispute resolution process. And remember that family dispute resolution process includes negotiation, collaborative negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. The court can also make orders that a parent is not allowed to remove the child without the agreement of the other parent or a further order of the court. Now, getting into parenting time a little bit, when a, when a spouse has parenting time, and this is important, they have the exclusive ability to make day-to-day -day decisions affecting their child during their parenting time. What that means is that when a parent has time with their children, they get to make decisions about, will it be sandals or rubber boots, uh, a warm coat or a t-shirt? You know, and that's all in their discretion. But they also have the discretion to make more important decisions, like emergency decisions, like what should happen if the child breaks their arm or has some other kind of an accident. And this is a this sort of authority is only held by that parent during their parenting time. So they don't have to worry about consulting the other parent, like, well, the child just broke their leg. Should we take them to the hospital or not? You just get to go and do that. Now, talking about decision-making responsibility, the court can share those responsibilities between parents, which is going to be the which is going to be the case more often than not, or it can say that just one parent will exercise a particular responsibility. So sometimes when spouses really have a hard time getting along with each other and can't seem to make a decision without arguing, well, the court might decide in really extreme cases that one spouse might have sole responsibility about extracurricular activities, for example, while the other spouse might have sole responsibility for education or religious training. Who knows? The other important thing about being somebody who has a parenting order is that as long as you have parenting time or decision-making responsibility, you are entitled to get information about your child's well-being, health, and education from anybody who happens to have it, including the other spouse, but also including people like doctors, teachers, dentists, coaches, counselors, and so forth. That's really important because if you are someone who is not a spouse and you have contact, you don't have that entitlement. 
Now, contact is available for people who aren't spouses, but in order to ask for contact with a child, you have to get permission from the court first. That's called applying for leave. So what would happen is that two spouses would already be in court in a divorce case, arguing about stuff involving their kids. And if you're somebody that wants to get involved in that and get contact with your child, first you have to make an application for leave from the court. And if you get leave, then you can make an application to have parenting time. And just like when the court makes parenting orders, it can make orders uh, with all kinds of different uh, conditions, such as limits or terms on how people communicate with each other, including a person who has contact and a spouse. Uh, it can impose terms and conditions like supervision or make someone's contact with a child conditional upon them doing something or not doing something. And it can make an order that somebody who has contact is not allowed to remove the child without the agreement of people uh, of a spouse or without further order of the court. Now, all sorts of orders about parenting time and decision-making responsibility might be also found in parenting plans. And another new term that we see in the Divorce Act is this, parenting plan. And that means a part of a document, usually a separation agreement, or perhaps something that's like it, like a memorandum of understanding or a memorandum of agreement. Um, so any kind of document that represents an agreement between spouses about parenting time, decision-making responsibility or contact, is a parenting plan, whether you call it that or not. Now, the court is also under an obligation to include parenting plans in a parenting order or a contact order, and the only time it can't do that is if it is not in the child's best interest to do that. Now, this is kind of interesting because you have to ask yourself, if the court's making a, a parenting order or a contact order, why does it need to include my parenting plan? And what I think it's all about is I think it's about making parenting plans, the agreement spouses and parents make between themselves, more easily enforceable by assuming that all that stuff is going to get jammed into a court order. Now, the moving bit is really important. As you can imagine, uh, when, when, a, when a spouse decides to move away from the other spouse after separation, that can sometimes be an enormous cause of conflict. And right now, the way the law works isn't very satisfactory, because the state of the law is so confusing, it's really hard for lawyers to advise somebody when they might be allowed to move and when they might not. So, under the new, uh, the new law, we have moves that qualify as relocations, remember that defined term, and moves that don't. Now, if it's not a relocation, in other words, the move is not likely to impair a child's relationship with a spouse or someone else who's important to the spouse's life, the person who wants to move, whether they want to move with or without the child, has to give notice to everybody else who has parenting time, decision-making responsibility, or contact about their intention to move. And typically, by the way, I think we'd be talking about moves that are fairly close, right? Within the same city or maybe, you know, not longer than an hour away than from the old home. But the notice that they have to give must be in writing. It has to state the date of the move and it has to provide the, the new contact information for the child so that the people who aren't moving can still get a hold of the child when they need to. Now, this notice, you can apply for an exemption from the requirement that you give it if there's family violence. But remember, you have to get a court order for the exemption. Otherwise, you have to give notice. Now, when a move does qualify as a relocation, the terms are different and they're much more important. Somebody who has parenting time or decision-making responsibility and wants to move away providing the move qualifies as a relocation, has to give 60 days notice to anybody else who has parenting time, decision-making responsibility, or contact with the child. The notice that they have to provide must be in writing. It has to state the date that they plan on moving. It's got to provide the new address and new contact information, but it also has to provide the person who's moving their proposal for how parenting time, decision-making or contact could work out in the event that they are allowed to move. Now, somebody who has contact is entitled to get this notice, but they're not entitled to object to it. In other words, you can find out, but there's nothing you can do about it. On the other hand, 
People who have parental responsibilities or parenting time, well, they have 30 days within getting the notice of the move in which to make an objection. And if they don't object, the move will be presumed to be allowed. So this is really important. So just remember that if you're somebody who gets a notice that the other parent is planning on moving, you've got 30 days to file your reply because if you don't object, they may be allowed to go. Now, when somebody does object to a proposed relocation, the legislation gives a whole bunch of additional factors that the court has to think about. Those include the reasons for the relocation, the impact of the relocation on the child, how and, and how much time the child presently spends with each person who has parenting time, and how involved they are in the child's life. The court also has to think about whether the person who's moving has complied with the notice requirements. And the court also has to think about whether there's an existing order, a separation agreement, or an arbitrator's award that says that a spouse can't move. And it has to think about all of these factors in addition to the ordinary best interest factors that we just talked about that you can find at section 16 of the revised legislation. Now, there's something that's a little more complicated uh, that is bundled into all of this. So just bear with me for a second. The burden of proof means who has the responsibility to convince the court that it should do something. And that can be really uh, important because the, the legal burden on the person who has the burden of proof is that, well, it's up to them to prove their case. And if they can't, then they don't get what they're looking for. Now, who has the burden of proof changes depending on the child's parenting arrangements. If the child spends, quote, substantially equal time in the care of each spouse, the burden of proof lies on the person who intends to relocate. But if the child spends the vast majority of their time with the person who wants to move away, then the burden shifts and it's up to the party who's staying and objecting to prove why the person who wants to move shouldn't be allowed to move. And in all those cases where the child isn't quite spending the vast majority of their time with the moving parent and isn't quite having substantially equal time with both parents, then each spouse has the burden of showing that relocation is or is not in the best interests of the child. So all of these funny little issues about what substantially equal means, because we don't have a definition of that, uh, and what vast majority means, because we don't have a definition of that either, is going to have to work out over time as the court hears one relocation case after another. And eventually we'll figure this out. And eventually lawyers will be able to advise their clients about whether a relocation application has a snowball's hope of succeeding or not. And that is, in a nutshell, an overview of the really important changes that are coming to the Divorce Act. <laughs>